If you've not uh, joined us on Facebook or you know you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, share it with your friends. <clears throat> Sorry about uh, maybe have some nasal issues. It seems like I've had a few nose surgeries, you know, and uh, sometimes I get a little plugged up, but uh, maybe got punched in the face a couple times. That probably didn't help either. But uh, what a great place to be out this morning, and uh, what a great family to be part of. I love this place. The Lord has provided a place, Grace Gospel Church, loving family, friends to come out, hear the word of God, grow in grace, and just uh, that I know that our life's got a purpose. As a saved child, as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you know, we all have our own testimony, our own walk, and like I shared last week, you know, I'm saying so thankful for the Lord, how he worked in my life. You know, he took my sister, and uh, just through my sister dying, it's how I came to Christ by faith. And one day I'm going to see her again. And I'm just so grateful how the Lord works in our life, and that I, I have a purpose. You know, until I'm called to glory, until I cross the threshold of death, I know I have a purpose. And I've been, you know, that God died for me, and he was buried and he rose again for me. That just shows how valuable that my life is. And that I could share that with somebody else. It's just a blessing. Just a blessing. And I'm just so grateful that we could come here and read the word, grow in grace. And because uh, as, a, as a believer, as a child of God, our timeline has just begun. I mean, we're talking. We get so many things to look forward to. We get the part of the rapture, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to come back to earth and rule a thousand years on earth. So many believers don't even know what the plan is. And then ultimately he's going to create a new heaven and new earth for us in the end. Second Peter chapter 3, Revelation 22 there, 21. New heaven, new earth. What does that look like? We don't know. But it's something we get to look forward to, for sure. This week here, uh, if you want to get the prayer list, uh, you can email me at the Good News Voice. We don't pass a hat here. And, uh, you know. I'm not the funniest guy, but sometimes I think my jokes can be pretty funny. A lot of other people don't think they're too funny, but sometimes I think I'm pretty funny. But the reason I don't pass the hat here is because my mom would take the hat. <laughs> no, no, my wife doesn't think I'm funny. <laughs> she does not. She reminded me last week that I'm not that funny. It irritates her when I crack jokes. But, uh, you know, some things are coming up. Craig, uh, Kate and Taylor will be having a baby here soon. We want to keep them in prayer. And Dr. Yankee and Betty. Dr. Yankee uh, was the president of the Florida Bible College. He's starting his evangelistic tour here soon. He'll be going to Arizona and working his way up, and he'll be here up here in May. And I encourage you, if you got some people that want to hear the gospel, and uh, he's... Uh, He's going to be speaking that Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then he'll speak that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So he'll speak here five times. And what a blessing to have him here come up in May. And excited to see him and Betty. And uh, just keep them in prayer, like I said. And our daughter, Miracles, Mary and Alex, they're here today. And uh, just keep that date in prayer for them. June 24th, we pray for divine weather. And uh, look forward to that day. And... You know, just keep them in prayer. What a blessing to have uh, your, your son or daughter to be equally yoked with somebody. And that's, a, that's a blessing as a parent. We have our women's uh, devotional study, the craft night. I believe it is tomorrow night, right? And uh, so if you want to be part of that, please come on. So this week's message is... Uh, author of eternal salvation, Hebrews 5.9. Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. You know, not, not something that some man had uh, visioned up or some man came up with. It is Jesus Christ. He's the one that wrote. He's the one that authored eternal salvation. You know, if man had to write a doctrine about it, he would say that you can lose it. But God, you know what? He completed it. It's his word, and it's eternal. The salvation he offers is forever. What a blessing to be able to read that here in Hebrews. It comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. 
It says, and being made perfect and became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And we know that obey means trust, believe. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Simply come to Christ by faith. Obey what he did for us. Trust that. Born again. Amazing. The gift of God. Um, one thing before we get in the message is the specific learning outcome. You know, one thing that we want everybody that is online or here in person that, that you could simply state where you're going when you die. We would not want to miss that. That you should be able to clearly state why, where you're going and where you're not going when you die. I know I'm not going to hell. Why? Because I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I believe that I became born again one time, just like Scout, she was born one time. We are born one time. We never lose that position as a child of God. We might fall out of fellowship, but we never lose the position of a sonship. And that's, hopefully you can understand. If you don't understand that, hopefully through the, today's message, you can make that decision today because it's a personal decision. If you would come to Christ by faith, you can absolutely know where you're going before we get there. God wants you to know that. You don't have to be the person that's laying on your hope, laying on your deathbed and be like, I hope I get in. Because if you think you're, you hope you might get in or you're probably trusting in your good deeds, you don't understand it. Hopefully to today, you would understand that Christ has done all the work and he freely offers you the free gift of eternal life. Seven points of truth. We've all sinned. For all have sinned and missed the mark of, of glory of God. And uh, we fall short of that glory. I say it all the time that we were in the jail on Monday night and two men came to Christ by faith, a man named Aaron and a man named Daniel. Daniel was lived up on Lawrence Lake and Aaron was from uh, Leech Lake. And both of them came into there. Both of them had a different path at the point in their life. They thought they, were, you know, one thought he might make it because of the deeds, good deeds in his life. And the other one thought maybe he you know, might dance with his ancestors in the sky someday. But they, you know what? We shared with them God's plan of salvation. They understood that they were sinners. They both placed their faith in Christ alone. It was amazing on Monday night in the jail. Ask that you keep them in prayer. But the point is, so many of us like to compare ourselves to men in jail. The neighbor down the street we need to compare ourselves to God. And when we compare ourselves to God, we fall short. We've missed that mark of perfection. For all of sin and come short of God's glory. We've earned the right to go to hell. People don't like to hear that. But that's the reality. For the wages of sin is death. We've all earned the right to go to hell. And that's why I love the second part of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're born sinners. We've earned the right to go to hell. It is because of his love for each and every one of us. That he went to the cross and he paid a death that I owed. He stepped in the gap and he said, I'll do that for them. That's a God that I fell in love with. I love him and I'm so thankful that he did that for me. We know that heaven's a perfect place. Not even a lie shall enter into it. We know that man cannot earn salvation. It is not by, or is not earned by de, you know, good deeds or you know, it's not a merit-based system. Like everything in the United States or in the world is merit-based. But salvation is not merit-based. It's by grace. It's freely given. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift. Good stuff. Christ died. That's history. Christ died for you. That's salvation. That's salvation. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For he hath made him to be sin for us. When he went to that tree, that cross, he took our sins and he bore our sins upon him. He paid for every one of our sins. We're going to look at a verse today in 1 Peter chapter 2, 24. It talks a little bit about that. But he did that so we could receive his righteousness. Colossians 2. It says that he paid for all trespasses. All trespasses. He died for all of your sins. All the sins of the world. An infinite God can make an infinite payment for sin for all mankind at a finite moment of time. 
The thing is, we know that he, how do I know he paid for all of my sins? Because I know he paid for all of your sins. All trespasses paid for. Now everybody doesn't go to heaven because not everybody comes to Christ by faith. Christ died. That's history. Christ died for you. That's salvation. All he asks is that you would believe over and over in the Bible. I think it's 98 times in, the New Te- in John. It's about believe. For God so loved the world, for God so loved Lance, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, not go to hell, but have everlasting life. Believe. John 6, 47 says that you can have it right now. Verily, verily, I say unto he that believeth on me hath everlasting right now. You can know you have eternal life because that's what he promises. Titus 1, 2, 1 John 5, 13. These things have written on you. Believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Good stuff. Love it. If you turn over your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 5. We have Bibles in front of you. Turn to page 1319. 1319, Hebrews chapter 5. The book of Hebrews has been a blessing to go through. And today we're going to study, we know we're probably in the next couple chapters, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 7, we're looking at the, the high priest, you know, after the order of Melchizedek. We'll get into that later on, maybe not today, but we're going to talk about some things in Hebrews chapter 5, that one of the things in Hebrews is Christ is far better. He's far better than Aaron. He's far better than Moses. He's far better than Joshua. He's far better than Abraham. He's far better than the first testament, the first covenant. He's far better than everything. And he fulfills all of those roles. And we're going to see that. So Hebrews chapter 5. I'll read the first couple of verses here. And then we'll come back and look at them. Look at the first four verses. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, as also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God was Aaron. So the first three verses there we just read. The Old Testament high priest was taken among, he was taken from among men. For all men, things related to God, like Aaron, Moses' brother. He was handpicked, ordained by God to be the high priest. The Old Testament high priest would offer both gifts and sacrifices. In Leviticus chapter 7, these are some of the offerings that they would offer. And every one of these offerings point to Christ. There was the burnt offering. We know that all the way back, I think it was even in Genesis chapter 4, they offered the burnt offering. Noah offered a burnt offering through the flood. The meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. Some of those offerings are actually a sweet-smelling Savior under God. It's a sweet aroma. My wife was making pasties yesterday. I was upstairs upstairs working on the message, and I could actually smell the pasties come up the stairs. And I yelled downstairs, like, man, it smells good. But some of these offerings are a pleasing sacrifice to God. Some of them are stench, like the sin offering. Yes, Christ died for our sins but it is a a stink offering. You know, it's too bad that he had to do that, but it's the only way it had to work. And that's what these high priests would offer up. They would offer up these offerings and gifts. Some of these offerings were a sweet as swelling aroma unto God, and some of them were not. We read that the Old Testament high priest should have compassion. We see that there in verse 2. On others when they sin, because he was a sinner himself. You think that a a priest or a pastor that knew what sin does, how sin hurts, hurts self, it hurts others. It's just every time we sin, actually we sin against God. How it kills, destroys relationships, it destroys countries. Sin requires a living person to die. That's what sin does. 
And you think today pastors and priests would alike would have compassion for sinners. Yet we see pastors today for praying for other pastors to fail. Somebody shared that with my wife and I this week. I'm not talking about other, all faiths and denominations. I'm talking about people that are saved. Pastors that are saved praying for other pastors to fail. Pretty sad. Pretty sad. Yet we have pastors praying for others, other saved churches to fail. We have saved pastors that are jealous of other people's ministries. We have saved pastors that are judgmental versus empathetic. It's all because they're sinners also. We are. And before we get mad at individuals, we should be like, hey, we need to pray for these people. That's what we need to do. See, these Old Testament priests were sinners. They had to offer sacrifices for themselves too. Saved pastors today are sinners. Pastors today need a Savior just like everybody else. Pastors are just as big as a sinner as the people out in the congregation. Nobody is better than anybody. We're all sinners saved by grace. And that individuals would get up on a soapbox, individuals that would get up on a, and think they're a little bit better than somebody else, you know, we need to pray for those people. See, saved pastors today should have compassion for others. We should. Ralph had shared at Bible study that he's so grateful to be part of a family that is loved. And I am grateful for a family that have to be able to come and not people. When, when people make mistakes, you know, we're not, everybody's not there to point fingers, but maybe to, to lend a hand to help a brother or sister up. Because that's what it is. The Christian walks hard enough versus having brothers and sisters pointing fingers at you when you fail. We're to have compassion for people. Safe pastors should be the most compassionate and the least judgmental and the least jealous. But that's not always the case. We know, and we know that because they're, they're sinners. Safe pastors need as much prayer today as others. And there's one thing I do covet, is I do covet prayers. Because we need prayers. Because I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. I have faults, I have struggles. I have the things I struggle with in my life every single day as everybody else. We all need a Savior. And I need help every single day, and that's why we go to the throne of grace in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Because every day we can find grace and mercy at the throne of grace in time of need. So we got to remember these individuals, they're sinners. And we're going to read about one that's not a sinner, the high priest. So we see in Hebrews 5 verse 4 here, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God and was Aaron. See, the Old Testament priesthood is not a position one could take in honor himself. A person could not say, today I'm going to be the high priest. Today I'm going to offer up incense in the, in, incense in the temple. Today I'm going to offer up the showbread. It didn't work like that in the Old Testament. It was an appointed position. And the high priest today is also an appointed position. See, Aaron was called into the priesthood, Aaron, Moses' brother. In Exodus 28, he says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, and from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Appointed by God, the Arianic priesthood. Number 1640 tells us, and we're going to go over to Numbers chapter 16 here, but you're going to read about a man named Korah, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron, no seed, not of the seed of Aaron, came near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah, and as company, as the Lord said to him by the land, by the hand of Moses. So we read about Korah. And maybe you've heard about Korah. If you read the book of Jude, mentions Korah in there. Well, this man, Korah, appoints himself as the high priest in the Old Testament. 
And we'll see what happens here. So if you have the Bible, turn over to Numbers. It's in the first five books of the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 16, which would be page 187. And encourage you to, to follow along and you'll see what kind of verses we're going to read there, right up there. We know that we've been studying numbers here because you know what? When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he departed the, he parted the Red Sea and brought them in. And it was uh, 60 days after that Moses was up on the mountain there, Mount Sinai, and he was getting the commandments. And 60 days later, because Moses went up the mountain for 40 days, but 60 days later, from the time of being redeemed out of Egypt, they already built a golden calf. They were complaining, they were murmuring, they were stiff-necked people, and they were causing a lot of problems. God had just, they got all the gold and silver out of Egypt when God sent them out. And they wanted to go back. And really, he was waiting for them to come into the promised land. He says, go into the land and take it. And they sent 12 spies. Caleb and Joshua were the two. And the 10 came back and said, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. And Caleb and Joshua were like, yes, we can go. See, Caleb and Joshua saw the, the size of the grapes, the giants of the grapes. But the 10 spies saw the giants in the land. And they're like, we can't go. We're defeated. So God cursed that whole generation. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Not one of them would go into the, to the land, the promised land. And that's us as our Christian life here on earth. It's not a picture of going to heaven. It's a picture of Christian victory. Because we need to cross the river. We, go, we need to go into the land. We need to, to fight the good fight. We need to, to see those giants but we need to focus on the size of the grapes. We need to be in the land of the milk and honey and know that the Lord will defeat the giants in our life. That's Christian victory. Versus wandering a life of in the wilderness, of a life without purpose. I'm a child of God, but just wander, be a babe, a carnal Christian my whole life? No. So that's what happened in Numbers chapter 12 and 13 and 14. We get to 16. And we'll see what happened. There's a group of individuals. They were mad. After the Lord had said this whole generation will die. Then they're like, okay, we'll go. Too late. Too late. So you have a man named Kor. And we'll look at verse 1 here. 16. He says, now Kor, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, Dothan, Ibaram, the sons of Eliab, On, the son of Peleth, the son of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So Kohath grabs all these known princes, men that are respected in that congregation of over a million Jews coming out of, out of Israel there. And they come up to Moses in verse 4. And when Moses heard it, I'll look at verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And he said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. You think you're special, Moses? You think you're special, Aaron? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. He was grieved. And he spoke unto Korah. And we could see the same thing in our churches today, believers doing the same thing, which is sad. And unto all the company saying, even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause them to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take you censers, Korah, and all his company. and Put fire therein and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Take ye much upon you, you sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here, I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? 
to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister under them? See, Korah was part of the Levitic tribe. He might not have been a part of the Arianic priesthood, but he still had a role with the temple. And he's like, Moses is like, do you think that's what you're doing for God is a little thing? But Korah didn't see it as a respectful thing. And 10, when he hath brought thee near to him, and all the brethren, the sons of Levi with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. See, he wanted more. He wasn't satisfied what God had worked in his life. He wanted Aaron's job. For which cause both thou and the company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? 28 through 25, or 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all the appertain, the people that were related to him, unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, and then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all the appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. 35, and there came out of the fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Verse 39 and 40, and Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers that these men had taken, wherewith they had were burnt and had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial. We read this verse first. Under the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, came near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and as company, as the Lord said unto him by the hand of Moses. See, Korah attempted to create a priestly ordain, a priestly order without divine authority. And that's a clear warning today for any priesthood that thinks they will create their own priestly order, their own way, without the divine authority of God himself. Aaron was called by God. Aaron's boys were called by God. However, Aaron died. His boys died. His grandchildren died. Let's read about another priest. Back in Hebrews chapter 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. Huh. Christ did not make himself a high priest. Hebrews 5. 5. Look what we read here. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he had suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So back to verse 5 and 6. Christ did not appoint himself to be the high priest. The writer of Hebrews quoted Psalm 2-7 and Psalm 110-4. In Psalm verse 5 there is basically what the Psalm 2-7 there it says, I would declare the decree the Lord had said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And we know that that verse is clarified, the Bible clarifies what that verse means. 
It's in Acts chapter 13. We don't ever really, if you study the Word of God and rightly divide it, the Word of God will always give us the answers. So what does that verse relate to? It relates to this. Acts 13, 33 and 34. How do I know that it's related to Psalm 2-7? Because listen what it says. God hath, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on the wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So the Bible tells us in Psalm 2-7, it's directly related to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now verse 6, and then we'll bring these things together here in a second. Psalm 110-4, he quotes in verse 6, in Hebrews 5-6, The Lord has sworn and will not repent, does not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the Bible affirms that the resurrected Savior is the high priest forever. Now at the end of the service, we're going to talk a little bit more about that because that is the meat. Because Hebrews 5 talks about the meat, verses 11 through 14. But you know what? What I want to point out is Jesus is not the high priest on earth because that had to come from the Levitical tribe. And these are just some things to point out, which is pretty interesting. You have the 12 sons of Jacob here, Israel. If you look at the 12 sons, you'll notice that Levi is written up here. And you'll see that Joseph is written up here. Now, Joseph was a son that was betrayed by his brothers. The 12 tribes of Israel, if you notice, are named after Jacob's sons. But you notice some of the names don't match. Levi is not in the 12 tribes. Why? Because Levi is a tribe that's dispersed amongst all the tribes. They were not given part of a land. The Levitical tribe was dispersed amongst every one of these when you study the Old Testament. So that means there's one less son. Well, Joseph had two sons. Remember, he had a double portion. He had Manasseh and Ephraim. And the Lord blessed him. Jacob blessed his son Joseph twice. So his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are also the 12 tribes. And that's just something just to know, because we know that the seed of David, the promise, comes through Judah, right here. The line of Judah. That's the promise that he would, that Jesus, the Messiah, would come through that line. So Jesus is the seed of David, the line of Judah. Jesus became the sacrifice on earth. He died, and now he's the high priest of heaven. Aaron was the priest, the high priest. He offered the blood of bulls and goats. What do the, bloods, the blood of bulls and goats do? In the Old Testament, Hebrews 10, 4, right here. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. But Jesus Christ, to become the high priest, at the throne of grace, in Hebrews 4.16, he offered himself a perfect sacrifice for sin. And when he resurrected from the grave, he went into the belly of the earth for three days. Remember, you know what? The, the Jews said, we want a sign in Matthew chapter 12, 40. And Jesus says, as three days Jonah was in the belly of the well, three days and three nights, so, so shall the Son of Man be in the middle of the earth for three days and three nights. And when he ascended to heaven, he took his blood and he brought it to heaven. That's what the high priest did here. So look at this verse here. This verse is related to Abraham when he offered up Isaac. When he went to Mount Moriah, where it's where the Temple Mount is today. You know you have uh, in the Temple Mount, when they're going to build the third temple. That temple, that, that temple Mount today has uh, two moss on it. But that Temple Mount is the same mountain where Abraham bought Isaac to be offered up. It's a, where Christ was crucified. And Genesis 20, 20, 22, 8 here, and he says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself a lamb. He is the lamb. 
2,000 years later, John the Baptist sees this lamb. And he says in John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 1 Peter 2.24 says this, Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. See, Jesus is the high priest forever. When he was on earth here, he offered himself as a sacrifice, resurrected from the grave, took his blood to heaven, and he's forever the high priest, sprinkling it on the mercy seat in heaven. It's his blood is in heaven as a forever a testimony that he paid for every one of our sins. How do I know this? Because the Bible tells us this. Again, I would ask that you turn your Bible over to Hebrews, that you would read this yourself. Turn over to Hebrews. This is some exciting scripture here. Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 28. And this is the meat of the scripture right here, that we have a high priest that sits at the throne of grace, and he's able to offer you grace and mercy at any time in your life. That's the meat of the word. And he says in 23, and they truly were, so Hebrews 7, verse 23, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests like Aaron did, to offer up sacrifices for, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered himself. For the law maketh men high priests, just like in the Old Testament, which have infirmity, they have sin. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. This is what the high priest did for us. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, blood of bulls, blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes and of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, dead men, they offer up dead works. When you hear scripture like this, you should understand what Christ did for all of us. And if you'd believe that, you'd be born again and become a child of God forever. Look what the high priest continues to do, verse 9, 22 to 28. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. If you study the Old Testament, there's 613 laws, not 10. And almost every law required a death payment, blood, sacrifice. And we know here, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness in 922. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Listen to this. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, he did not go to the Temple Mount and enter Solomon's Temple. No, he did not. Which are a figure of the true. But he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often had suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. How Christ became a lamb as a sacrifice, went and died for all of our sins. He resurrected as the high priest, taking his blood, going to heaven, and showing it, going into the temple, sprinkling his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, forever a testimony for the eternal redemption that he's purchased us. All the little things in the Old Testament are a picture of what Christ did for us. He is our high priest. It's absolutely amazing what he's done for us. Hebrews 5, 7 and 8 says, Who in the days of his flesh, we can remember when he, in the book of Luke, he took, I think it was Peter and James and John, and he's told them to pray for the flesh is weak, and then they fall asleep. But I remember in Luke it talked about, it was a stone's throw away, and how he was, I think he had fallen on his knees, Christ. And he was sweating droplets of blood. He, was, he knew exactly what was placed before him. And he says, you know, in Matthew 26, if this cup could pass for me, Lord, let it pass. He goes to the Father three times, and he doesn't say it for his benefit. But see, it was a cup that only he could drink. It was a cup that he could only fulfill. And he drank it. He went to the cross and he died for the sins of mankind. So when we read 7 and 8 here, it is at that time. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard and that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. See, Jesus didn't do this for his benefit. He did these things for our benefit. See, Jesus at any time, he was fully God. He was fully man, but he fully God. But he fully was obedient unto the Father. He didn't do things out of his own will. He come to do a job that the Father wanted him to do. So when we read these verses like this, we can, this is for us. So one, so we can follow and learn, one, how to be an obedient child of God as he was obedient. But then we also, that he did this so that he could forever be our high priest also. Jesus, in John chapter 13, in the upper room discourse, he says this, that he's the example. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. See, we can learn from our big brother in heaven how to be obedient unto the Father. Jesus did not come to do his will to be done. John 6, 37 through 40 says that. In verse 38, it says, For I have I come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. See, Jesus Christ in his earthly walk lived by faith. He actually was led by the Spirit of God. In Luke 4, 1, he yielded unto the Spirit to guide him. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Christ is full of the Holy Ghost. We should be full of the Holy Ghost. We need a daily feeling of the Spirit. We never lose the Spirit, but we need a daily feeling by reading the Word. Christ was led by the Holy Spirit. We should be led by the Spirit. In Romans 8, it says this, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, we, when we get born again, when we read the Word of God, 
that we would, our minds would be transformed by the word of God. We would not be conformed to this world, but we would be transformed into the image of his son. That we're given a new nature, a nature that's from God, that's sinless. That we get through the Holy Spirit, that through the Lord working through us. So we can be more like Christ. But Kevin talked about that old nature, new nature. It's forever a battle. That old nature doesn't get any weaker the older we get. We just have our bodies that just can't probably do the things that our old nature wants to do like we did when we were 20. But we have that new nature, and it's a baby when it's born, just like Scout is a baby. You can forever be a carnal Christian, a babe in Christ, or you can be a young man or an old man in Christ. And you get that by through reading the Word of God. That we could grow up and be like Christ. That we can learn that it's His will to be done in our lives and not our own will. That we can understand that our life has a purpose. And that purpose is to seek and save the lost. Maybe if you're, if you're not called to seek and save the lost, maybe your purpose is to win the saved. Somebody that's come to Christ by faith but no longer goes to church, no longer reads, no longer is in fellowship, that maybe you could reach back and help that believer up. Because he is a brother and he says a sister in Christ. But we're given a new nature from God that is created in the image of his son so we can be conformed in the image of his son. See, Jesus experienced these things in the flesh so he then could relate as the high priest. See, we have a God that doesn't, that does, that he doesn't be like, oh, I wonder why Lance is struggling with that. We have a God that can relate to everything that we're going through. The Bible tells us that. He's not a God that's not unfamiliar with what we're struggling with. Hebrews 10, 2.18 says, For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he's able to secure them that are tempted. Look at Hebrews 5 here, or 4, 14 through 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points temp tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And this is why we, in the last couple Sundays, we've actually reviewed these things. Jesus knows what it feels like to be a helpless baby. As Scout was crying here, he knows exactly what it feels like to be Scout. Our son Ezekiel, you know, has some digestive problems. He knows exactly what it was to be just like our grandson. Has, he knows what, exactly what it feels like to have those digestive issues. But he knows what it feels like to grow up. He knows what it feels like to experience weariness and hunger and thirst. When he went to the woman at the well, he said they went to the town, his apostles, to get food. But he also knows this. He knows what it's what it feels like to be, dis to be despised and rejected. Have you ever had a friend that despised you or rejected you? He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what it is to be lied to and falsely accused. I'm sure we've all been lied to and falsely accused in our life. He knows what it is to suffer and physically die. He knows what it is to experience the resurrection. Jesus is a high priest that truly had compassion for us, his brothers and sisters in Christ. See, he's not a selfish God, like pastors like me, that I could be selfish. He's not a jealous God. He's not jealous of everybody else's ministries. He doesn't pray that we fail. He's not hardened with judgment. But he's an empathetic high priest. He understands all things. And he knows exactly where you're at and what you're going through in your life. See, this is why in Hebrews 4, 16, which a verse I love, that you can go to him because he's a high priest today, a living God that sits at the throne of grace and he's ready to hear your prayers. And that's why it says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Maybe you made a mistake. 
and not get what you deserve. You can obtain mercy. You can get grace, not get what you deserve. You get something, you know, that you don't deserve. You can find help in the time of need in your life. No matter what trial you're going through in life, he knows and he can help. And I say that either we're walking in a problem, we're in a problem, we're walking out of a problem, but we're all in a problem in one way in our, our, one way of our, in our life. And we have a high priest that knows exactly where you're going through, and he can help you with whatever you're struggling with in life. See, Hebrews 5, 9 and 10, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him, called of God of the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is in Genesis 14. We're going to get that later in the future. But he is the high priest forever. He's the high priest that offered himself, the Lamb of God, a perfect sacrifice for the sin of all mankind. His resurrection is proof he paid for all his sin. He ascended to heaven, and he is a priest, a high priest forever. Since his priesthood is forever, think about this. He can give his people an eternal salvation. Since his priesthood is forever, he's able to save, keep, strengthen his people forever. The words being made perfect does not mean he wasn't imperfect. The word imperfect comes from the Greek word teleo. It means to complete, to bring to an end. It is through the suffering of Jesus Christ in his flesh that he can now be the high priest and know exactly what we're suffering with and going through as a child of God. That we don't have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That we can come into a land of rest. We can have Christian victory in our life. That we can live a Christ-dependent life, not live an independent Christian life. That anyone can come to him by faith and he then can be like, okay, I want to take his sins and I'll impute my, impute my righteousness to his account. He is now a child of God. At any time, he'll impute his perfect payment for sin to, to anyone's account. And then forever become a child of God. Christ is able to strengthen his brothers and sisters in Christ forever. Because he forever sits at the throne of grace, giving grace and mercy in time of need. Now let's talk about the meat. First, I'll read 11 through 14 and we'll come back. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when you were the time you ought to be teachers, you need that one teach you again, which be of the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He is a babe, but strong meat belong to them that are full of age. Those, by reason to use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, the Jewish, Jewish Christians at this time, the, the, was let, this letter that was written to the Jewish Christians in the first century there, which the temple was probably still built at that time. The Romans, Titus, had not destroyed the temple yet. See, they were dull of hearing to God's word. Hebrews 3.7 it says, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, they didn't. They had a hardened heart, verse 3-8. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. See, they provoked God, just like the Israelites provoked God. They would not mix the word of God with faith, Hebrews 4-2. That's what we're to do. We're to take God's word and apply it and mix it with faith and take God at his word. They would not hear his word daily, verse Hebrews 4, 7. They were dull of hearing. Then Hebrews 5, 12 says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. See, all of us have a responsibility to share God's word. Dads have been called to ensure the gospel is clear in the home, as dad is the spiritual leader of the home. And he's not and all allow not allow a perverted message to come in the home. Moms and grandmas, just like Timothy, 
Moms and grandmas have been called to share the gospel of Christ with their children and raise their children on the gospel of Christ. All of us have the responsibility to teach and share. The Jewish Christians were wandering in their Christian walk just like the Israelites wandered for 40 years. The Israelites refused to come into the land of giants. However, in the land of giants, we need to remember this. In the land of giants are the giant grapes. In the land that's the land of milk and honey, it's where the battles are fought. It's where Christ will have victory in our life. It's also where we find rest. For a child of God, are you, putting, are you going to wander in the wilderness your entire life? Or you know, go allow God to have victory into your life? We should be living by grace through faith, growing in his knowledge, growing in the knowledge of Christ so we can cross over the river, enter the land of giants, allow God to defeat these giants in our life and enjoy eating the giant grapes, those blessings in life. In the land of milk and honey, whereas we Christians can find rest in a crazy chaotic world, we can have peace. See 13 and 14, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, he's a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See a babe, like Scout, will put anything into their mouth. A babe in Christ will listen to any pastor speak and not have discernment. A babe in Christ will go back under the law for they have no discernment. This is exactly what the book of Hebrews was written. These people were saved and they went back under uh, the law. They wanted to go back under sacrificing animals. They didn't have discernment. A babe in Christ will walk in the flesh and remain a carnal Christian. A babe in Christ will live an independent Christian life versus a Christ-dependent life. The milk of the word is Christ's finished work on earth. In this context, you can see that the meat of the word is Christ's work as the high priest. I've heard people say, we want the meat of the word. Matter of fact, I was in Cohasset, I was a pastor for 10 years there, a couple came and they said, we want you to meet, we want to meet. I went to their house and they told me, they said, we're not getting meat. They made the comment. People have always commented about, we want to be fed meat. Well, what is the meat? In John chapter four, Jesus was at the water of the well let me read what he says here. But he said unto them, I have, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples, one to other, hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus said unto them, my meat is to the will of him that sent me and finish his work. The milk of the word is Christ's finished work on earth. You hear the gospel of Christ, you believe, you get saved. Then you get nourished on the word, you read the word, you grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. The meat of the word is doing the Father's will. The meat of the word is Christ as the high priest. Jesus Christ come to seek and save the lost. The meat of the word of God is sharing the gospel with others, doing his will. We should want to do the same. This is why we're to live by grace through faith. Grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Read the word. Yield to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, of the word. And when we struggle, go to the throne room of grace where the high priest is able to give us grace and mercy in time of need. Application for me today? Is there a promise to proclaim? Yes. Jesus Christ is the forever high priest. Is there a truth proclaimed? Yes. Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation. Is there a command to follow? Yes. Be not dull of hearing. Grow in the word. You want to meet the word? Read his word every single day in your life. Let me show you something. 
If you've not seen this, I'd ask that you just look up here for a second. Let this hand here represent you and I. This wallet here represents our sin. Say, God loves us. If you're sitting here today, I want you to know that God absolutely loves you. But sin, Isaiah 59 tells us, sin separates us from God. Now man will try to tell you that you can cover that sin up. They say, you know, just, just do a, a few good things, go to church. They, people think if they go to church, it makes them a Christian. No, not at all. My Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past, revealed himself in the flesh, and he shed his blood. And he died. And he rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sins paid in full. And if you would believe that, believe he did that for you, he gives you his righteousness put to your account. That's the good news. I would ask that everybody just close their eyes for a second. We're not going to embarrass anybody here at the church or at home. But if you just heard that, that's the good news. You heard that you're a sinner. You know you've sinned. You know you've missed the mark of perfection. You know you're not good enough to go to heaven. But you heard how much Christ loved you. He loves you right where you're at right now. He paid for all of your sins, even the ones you've not committed yet. And you're like, man, that sounds great. In the quietness of your mind, you could say something like this. You know you're a sinner. You could say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell when I die. I want to go to heaven. I just heard the good news. How much Christ loved me. He died for everyone of my sins. I'll believe that. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Was buried and resurrected for me right now. I believe he did that for me. If you did that right now, you were born again. It's that easy. It's what you believe. If you have come to Christ by faith, like Kevin said, I would love to know. If today was the first day you've trusted in Christ alone, today, you can share that with me or not. I would love to know. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're so grateful that Christ was the Lamb of God. The whole Old Testament pointed to him. Revealed himself in the flesh, went to the cross, died a death that we all owed. He stepped in the gap, paid the perfect, for, perfect sacrifice for sin for all of us, resurrected from the grave, and now he has ascended into heaven where he's alive. He's the high priest forever, making intercession for us, mediating on our behalf, giving us grace and mercy all of our days, each and every day in time of need that we as a child of God can boldly go to the throne of grace at any time in our life and ask for grace and mercy. For we know the high priest has went through everything that we are going to go through. He has not went through anything that we haven't. And he can help us in our time and our hour of need. And every one of us is going to need that time of need. And to know that we have a high priest that's alive today, waiting patiently for us to lay our petitions down before him. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for being able to be call ourselves a child of God. We're so grateful for this family here, the words of life that we can read and grow in grace. We just love your word. We love growing and we love hearing. And one day, we'll forever be in your presence. Father, we just pray that you bless these people that can come out and continuously serve and support the gospel-driven ministry. We just pray that you bless these people, bless their families, keep them safe. Be with people that are going through some serious struggles this week, Father. Bring us all back where we can continue to give glory to you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, page 87.